I'd like to thank everyone for coming uh, today to the uh, this uh, meditation workshop. And of course, the joke is that we had this terrible time setting up the television. Uh, and it just shows you how valuable, um, how much we've come to rely on. It's not how valuable they are, but how much we've come to rely on electronics to help us do our work and to entertain us and to keep us from meditating, keep us from sitting and being reflective and contemplative. So now it almost seems like a mistake to use a PowerPoint in this class. So there may be por uh, portions where I just turn it off. Uh, for the for the benefit of people at home, uh, I'm uh, I'm going to show the prayers that we're going to start with this morning on the screen, and uh, and but you have them in your red books. And uh, because uh, this um, the the wording in these uh, in the English translation, I would do these in English, except that the wording in the English translations are different on the one that's on your screen and the one that's in your hand. So in order to um, um, in order uh, to do the um, to do it the prayer justice, we're going to recite it in Tibetan. And so I'll use the simplest melody I know. And if you can't quite follow, just listen along. Because the function of the opening prayer is to set our intention for being here. Because every, every moment of our life is guided by our intention, our inner intention. And this is why meditation is so valuable and so important. Because every minute of every day of, of our lives is guided by our inner intention. Our mind is in the driver's seat and the body and the speech just follow their commands. So this means if we go back to the very beginning of Buddhism, the Buddha said, we are what we think. All that we are arises with our thoughts and with our thoughts, we make our experience in this world. So that's why we're learning to meditate today. And we're going to do some meditation together. But I did. I did make the PowerPoint, so we will start with the. We'll start with the prayer. Uh, the again, if this melody that I'm using is unfamiliar to you, you don't have to worry about it. it you can just uh, start your meditation now by quietly listening to us chant this traditional melody and prayer that goes back centuries to the great um, Pengar Jampo Zampo, who was a who lived somewhere in the. 14, 15, 1600s. So somewhere around there. Okay, here we go. Oh, oh boy, I have three melodies to choose from. Which one will come up? That's the question. Oh, yeah, okay. Hmm, interesting. Marpa <laughs> Chase <laughs> Nyame drogunda poka jula so adeb so ka jula mama jupati no nam pa jilo. Jen lo kong ki kang 
Pasun Pajan Zenor Kula Chan Jen He Pada Sadir Du Tang Chu Pe Kong Chen La Ne Kurjan Pahome Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm going to do something that I hope will be helpful and that is turn off the PowerPoint. All right, um, let's see, uh, could somebody help me with the, yeah, and yeah, thanks very much. You're really kind, I appreciate that. Okay, well, we'll come back. Okay, bye. Um, it was um, uh, it was such a trial using the uh, using the uh, PowerPoint. So um, I'm going to just dispense with it for the time being and rely on my original notes uh, for presenting to you today. Um, my name is Kathy Wesley, and I work here at the Columbus Karma Takes and Choling Tibetan Buddhist Meditation Center. I've been part of the meditation center since its inception. Uh, in 1977, and uh, I and some of the original folks from the original group of people studied with uh, our founder, Kempo Karthar Rinpoche, who started this center uh, at the request of students in Central Ohio in 1977 and remained its spiritual director, remained the spiritual director of this center until his death in 2019. So you can imagine uh, the, the loss we felt when he passed away because he was an extraordinary teacher who really understood Western people, even though he himself was born in Tibet and had spent his uh, entire youth uh, studying monasticism, meditation, and, and, uh, and the uh, Buddhist life. So when he left Tibet uh, as a refugee seeking asylum, in uh, in 1959, it was a different world than, than it is today. 
And the, when he came to the United States and began teaching, he, um, he recognized right away that uh, the minds of Western people were trained differently than those of the people he had encountered previously. And he found a way through his incredible skill and his insight he came, he came to understand us in some ways better than we understood ourselves. Because even though we grew up in a different culture, with a different lifestyle, with different value system than his, he came to understand we were all human beings. We were all human beings and that human beings have been the same since the beginning of human beings. And so we would all benefit from the basic skills of mindfulness and meditation that the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni, taught 2,500 years ago in India. And so as a result, his teaching, although rooted in his Tibetan upbringing, was nonetheless able to convey to us incredible depth and strength. And so, uh, and so I feel very lucky to have been in that generation of practitioners. I see several people in the room. Has anybody in this room also seen and heard Kembo Karth Rinpoche teach? I think there's maybe only a handful. There's one, two, yeah, just a couple of us. Okay. Well, you're going to get a little bit of Kempo Karth Rinpoche long distance today. Uh, because um, since the Buddha taught that the mind of an individual does not go out of existence upon their death, but continues on uh, in this in uh, in some way in this world, we we sort of believe he's still here in some way, even if his only existence is in the teachings that we ourselves received from him and practiced. So I want to welcome you to uh, Kempo Kartha Rinpoche's uh, World of Meditation. The material I'm going to be sharing uh, will be found uh, in this book, uh, the Dharma Paths book. This is the old edition. Uh, there is a newer edition that has a, pretty, a prettier cover, although I think this cover is quite handsome. A friend of mine designed it, so I'm partial. Uh, and um, he wrote uh, an extensive uh, his an extensive book here covering all aspects of Buddhist practice, from our first inkling that there is something beyond the mind we have now, and uh, into Buddhahood. It's all it, it, his teachings on this are explained, including his teachings, his basic teachings on meditation. Uh, the other book that I'm going to be referencing today is this book, Excellent at the Beginning, uh, Kempo Karthar Rinpoche's book uh, on practical aspects of Buddhist practice. So that's a little bit about what we're going to be doing today. Uh, and additionally, uh, we'll be meeting, uh, we'll have uh, four sessions today. The first session is from now through um, the 12 noon hour. At the 12 noon hour, we will break for lunch. Um, I encourage folks to bring a sack lunch, but if not, we do have coffee and donuts downstairs. Uh, compliments of our host this morning, Chuck. And um, sorry for the Zoom audience. Wish you could be here for coffee and donuts. But... Um, uh, and then we'll begin again at 1 p.m. and go till 3 p.m. today. So um, the the function of um, of meditation is to work with our minds because look at what we go through trying to interact with our world every day. Look at how difficult it is for us. We have all kinds of problems that come up and we have to be able to deal with them with as much grace as we possibly can. And so it's um it's a challenge for us. We have all kinds of things that cause us distress. We have uh, physical problems. We have emotional challenges. We have um, family challenges. We have so many things that happen uh, in our everyday life. And sometimes we almost feel like 
uh, we're being ordered around by our by our mind. And, and in fact, I remember when I first started teaching meditation, I thought it's like having a, a, a um, untrained animal on a leash, you know? And, and in fact, um, the nine stages of shamatha uh, that I'm going to be explaining here today, uh, it references the... Um, it references a drawing that I, that everybody is going to get a copy of and be able to take home. It's going to um, that is of a meditator chasing their mind in the form of an elephant. In classical um, in classical uh, Buddhist teaching, the elephant was symbolic of the mind. Okay, here we go. I think this is going to take, this is going to work. Let's see. All right. The Zoom link has now been shared with everyone. And it, 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 it you know, so let's hope. Let's hope everybody who signed up actually gets it. So um, because our mind is the, the, the seed of all of our experience, if we want to work with our experience, we have to work with our minds. Because as I mentioned, we have so many obstacles and problems. And sometimes our mind doesn't react well. Sometimes our reactions actually make us feel worse. And then we get mad at ourselves. Why did I react like that? So it's like almost like there's the initial stimulus, something went wrong. Oh, something went wrong. The initial stimulus, then there is our initial response, which is, oh, this is terrible. This is awful. And then we get angry. And then we say, oh, I got angry. That makes me mad at myself. And so we have to find a way to peel all of these back to as close as we can to that initial moment, that initial moment of experience in the mind. Because the, the Buddha's teaching about the mind was that the senses, the tasting, touching, seeing, hearing, all of that, all that does is convey information. The body conveys information, but it is the mind that experiences these things. And the mind is shaped and formed by its habits. These habits come from long ago. If you believe that there is only one life and we are in it, from our birth until now, that's a pretty long time for our habits to have formed. But if you believe in past and future lives, there's an even longer timeline we have to work with, a longer timeline of habit that we have to work with. And what we know based on our own experience is that when we exercise and strengthen, we strengthen a habit. When we exercise that habit, we strengthen it. So that when something, when we have that stimulus, something frustrates us or makes us unhappy and we instantly react, then we get mad at ourselves for our reaction. There's several layers of us trying to work with ourselves, but we don't have methods or techniques. And this is the function of meditation. Meditation slows down the process of the mind. It slows down the thought process, the perceptive process, it slows down all the processes so that we can literally take a breath and make a different decision. Maybe not right away. Maybe we won't make that positive decision right away, but we can eventually make a more positive decision about what to do with our mind, what to do with that reaction, how to comfort ourselves in times of difficulty, how to be present for others in times of their difficulty. This is to me is the gift that comes to us from doing meditation. So as promised, I'm going to ask you what you would like to learn today. Part of the reason I would like to do this is so that I make sure that I aim my, uh, aim my uh, program at exactly what you would need to hear today. Because uh, let's face it, we came for a reason. Uh, and it was not just curiosity to see this amazing uh, building on the inside, but because we wanted to learn something. 
So um, first of all, let me ask a quick question. How many people here have been meditating for um, one year or longer? Okay, five years and longer. Ooh, okie doke. Uh, less than one year? All right, you guys, were, I'm here for all of you. I'm here for all of you because I remember what it was like to be new. And I remember what, uh, how I would have wanted to hear a presentation, how I would have wanted to be addressed and so on. So I'll do my best. Okay. Um, so if anybody, uh, I can have about five minutes uh, and um, I will ask uh, for um, uh, Don and John and um, Lonnie to on Zoom to uh, pass any of uh, questions from the floor. So let me get the, the uh, any things from here first. Anybody have something they want to make sure they learn today? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, this is a really good thing, and I'll repeat for the people um, uh, uh, in the audience and on Zoom. The the questioner is saying that the challenge, their challenge is that they want to have a positive altruistic intention in their life to benefit everyone, but it's really hard to do it with anything more than lip service right now. And how can meditation help with the process or how can a person who wants to keep that intention, keep it through the, through all of their life? It is a very slow process. First of all, that's my initial answer. It's a very slow process, but through meditation, we can do it incrementally over time. And my teacher said, you can't make all of these changes in your attitude immediately, but meditation gives you a little breathing room so that you can begin to make the change. But so we'll get more into that. But thanks for that. We'll we'll see if we can address that. Anything else that people want to make sure they hear today? A yes in the back and then in, in the next row. There is okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The questioner is saying that for them, uh, they're they're interested in learning a technique for lengthening the um, the distance between thoughts because they've heard people talk about uh, reaching a state where there are not many thoughts. And we're actually, if if I can get the PowerPoint to work. Um, uh, we will uh, we will uh, show you a diagram that talks about that. And so hopefully that will be part of the presentation today. I have time for one or two more. Oh, yes, yes, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Understood. The questioner is saying that for them, their challenge is um, that they've made a lot. Well, basically, their statement is that they've made a lot of progress uh, in being able to um, be present with people and not and to let go of things that are bothersome but that they're looking to be able to continue a, 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 a discomforting or an uncomfortable interaction um, instead of just excusing themselves. Because I, I do agree that this is sometimes the only way for us to feel safe and for us to feel um, able to continue uh, is by disengaging from 
difficult situations, but what you're liking to learn is how to continue to be engaged while um, while a discomforting experience is going on. Okay, interestingly enough, these two questions are related and it has to do with um, the object of meditation and uh, and changing objects of meditation can also help. So we can talk about that. Okay, okay, time for one more. One more thing that somebody would like to learn today. Okay, anything from Zoom? Okay, very good. So we'll get started then. Um, uh, the the uh, basics of practice are uh, body at ease and mind at ease. So we will start with a basic instruction and a short sitting. So everybody has learned different methods of meditation. And, uh, and many of you, especially if you've been meditating for five years or longer, will um, maybe not take to this method that I'm going to present now. It's okay. You can use your, uh, your, um, your tried and true method unless it involves movement and unless it involves uh, singing. So, because uh, we are going to go for silent meditation today. Um, so uh, the technique that I learned from Kempo Kartha Rinpoche uh, is based on a statement, a body at ease, mind at ease. And uh, I'm going to uh, demonstrate for you uh, here, sitting in the chair, I provided myself with a way to do it on the floor as well. But uh, I think I may not do that because of the delay in starting today. So I'll have to do it with my visual aids, using my arms and my shoulders to stand for my legs, my knees, and my hips. So pardon me in advance for the strange visual aids that you'll be seeing in the next few minutes. So placing the body at ease means to, um, uh, to we build that we build the meditation posture from the ground up. If we're sitting in a chair, this means we begin with our cushion and our legs. My teacher said that the ideal cushion is four finger widths high. Now, this is a problem for many people who come, who live in a culture where chairs exist. If you haven't grown up sitting on the floor, four finger widths is a very small cushion. So you might need to double that or even triple that in order to feel comfort as you sit but I thought I would give his instruction of the four just for, just for reference point. So it starts with the cushion. Now, if you're sitting in a chair, this means that uh, you should sit with your um, feet flat on the floor uh, and your legs can be hip width apart. And uh, then if you're sitting on the floor, your legs can be in one of several postures. Some people like to just sit cross-legged, uh, loosely cross-legged. Some people like to sit in the, what's called in uh, Hatha Yoga, the lotus posture, and it's called in Buddhism, the Vajra posture, with the left foot on the right thigh and the right foot on the left thigh. Um, this is a little difficult. In fact, my teacher said uh, the uh, only way you should do this is if you can uh, right away when you meditate is if you can do it with comfort. Otherwise, he said, you're going to have to practice it for a while before you try to do it while meditating. He said, for example, do it while watching television. That may distract you from the pain, he said. I love this sense of humor. In any case, um, that's how you can place your legs, or you can sit in half lotus with one, one leg tucked in and one on top, or in what's called the easy pose with one leg in front of the other. Whichever of these methods you use, uh, the, the key is for your knees to be at the same level or below your hips. Because if the knees are raised above your hips, after a while, your hips and back will start to feel pain. Now, this means if you're sitting on the floor, but what does this mean if you're sitting on the floor and your feet don't touch the floor? Well, then you have to put a cushion under your feet. We have three different levels of cushions here. So you can pick the one that allows you to sit with your knees below your hips. So that's the, the legs. And, uh, and the next part of it is your seat. Uh, you can... Uh, 
there are two ways to ground yourself on your seat. One way is to uh, rock gently from side to side and tuck in the muscles of the backside. Another way is to, um, uh, to do a, uh, a, a short exercise called the drawing up in which a person tightens and draws up the muscles of the pelvic floor briefly and then relaxes as a way of establishing oneself on one seat. So we've covered the seat and the legs, now the back. The back should have its nice natural curves in it. Uh, you can actually imagine the breastbone moving up and that will give you a straight posture without the shoulders being hunched. I had a friend who was a martial arts teacher. He said, if you wanna know what your comfortable back position is, he said, you uh, bow your back incorrectly and then you arch your back a little too much and then take a few degrees off the arch of your back until you're comfortable. Next, the shoulders, hands and arms. I know you see many people sitting with their hands up in meditation, but the function of our meditation here is grounding. So we place the hands palm downward on the legs. Now, I know many of you will be familiar with images of Buddha statues in which the Buddha is sitting in a position with the left hand on the bottom, the right hand on the top, and the thumbs touching. This is actually listed in the sutras. However, Kempo Karthar Rinpoche said he preferred the hands on the legs for one reason. He said very few people can actually sit in the lotus or vajra posture. And he says, if you cannot sit in the lotus or vajra posture, attempting to sit in this artificial pose will make it difficult for you because you'll have to hold it artificially. Whereas if you can do the lotus posture, he said, you can just sit, you can rest your hands on your upturned feet very comfortably. But for the rest of us, our hands are downward. My teacher, uh, Rinpoche, also gave a method for placing your thumb at the base or the first joint of the ring finger and then closing one's hands in a light fist. Your hands look like lion's paws, he said. He said the benefits of this is it creates good movement of energy in the body, and it also keeps your hands warm. The chin can be tucked in slightly, which you can feel straightens the neck vertebrae, bringing some comfort. Your eyes can be cast downward slightly a few feet ahead. You're gazing, not looking, you're gazing in the general area. Your eyes can be uh, partially open. Some people ask, well, what's the function of this? My uh, My advice is that the reason that I tell people this is important is because we're not trying to shut out the world with meditation. We're trying to be with the world. But if this is problematic, it's okay to close your eyes lightly. But of course, I have to warn you, you might fall asleep. And then the final posture to learn of, there are seven in all, and I've covered six of them. To review, the legs, the seat, the back, the shoulders, hands and arms, the chin, the gaze, and now the tip of the tongue can be touched to the upper palate of the mouth, the roof of the mouth behind the front teeth and allowed to relax. And this re relaxes the muscles and the jaws. So let's just sit in this posture for a moment. Emperor Impache told us this posture all by itself can cause a little bit of relaxation to the mind.
So that's the physical uh, preparation. The mental preparation is to um, form the wish to meditate for the benefit of yourself and the benefit of all beings. Forming that mental intention, the meditation itself begins with uh, one deep breath. And uh, through the nose, if possible, and your mouth, if you're congested, and then breathing out. After this initial breath, one allows the breath to come and go naturally. And we allow our attention to rest as the breath as it goes in and the breath as it goes out. We'll do this for a little while. As you practice, you can uh, notice the breath and how it feels going in and how it feels coming out. And you can notice the feeling as it comes in and goes out. What you'll notice is that it might be easy to place the attention on the breath for a few seconds, but the attention can sometimes wander into the past or into the future. And that's when we use a, the technique that one Lama called touch and go, where you touch the thought lightly with your attention you can even label it thinking. Then you consciously let go of it and consciously and gently with love and compassion, gently usher your attention back to the breath and think of that as a fresh start. So we'll just sit like this for um, a couple of minutes to begin with. Resting the attention on the breath as it comes in and goes out. And when the attention wanders, we bring it back gently and think that we're starting fresh.
Okay, that's a very, very short practice of meditation. So um, are there any questions uh, or, um, about this? Uh, how was it? Was it easy, difficult, problems, questions? What, what do you have? Any, any response? No? Yes, in the back. Okay. Yeah, that's good. The 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 comment is that uh, uh, the the person is saying that at home they don't often pay uh, a, a attention to the posture. Uh, that's uh, and 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 it really does um, the the term that Kempo Rinpoche used when he talked about the feeling of putting your body into the posture was he called it harmonious surprise. He said, you can be surprised at how good it can feel. Now, a lot of people have pain when they meditate and they, they ask, well, what do I do if I feel uncomfortable or if uh, I have an itch or something, you know, what, how, what do I do? And, um, and the answer uh, that Rinpoche gave usually would be, tell yourself, there's nothing you have to do about it just now. When you first feel discomfort, say to yourself, hmm, interesting. I don't have to do anything about that just now. And then he said, you return your attention to the breath and then uh, observe the breath again. And he said, if it comes back, he said, then that's the time to move your posture or adjust your posture so you are more comfortable and so forth. He said, uh, what this technique does is he said, it gives you a little extra strength in your meditation because he said, you did not move in an impulsive way, in a reactive way. He said, you went a little farther than you thought you could go, but not too far. Because I think um, this is where some of the injury of meditation can occur because this of course is a, a phenomena that's being studied now. People who have adverse reactions to meditation. And so when this type of, if any type of adverse reaction happens, that's when you talk to your instructor and say, when I meditate, this happens. Some For some people that adverse is um, a feeling of pain for other people, it's a feeling of being nervous. So there are lots of things that can happen when a person meditates. And meditation, this particular style of meditation is not for everyone. Uh, like I say, for some people, it makes them feel a little bit more nervous. And for other people, um, it can feel um, a little bit scary because they, they most of us are not used to working with our mind one-on-one. -on -one. Most of us work with our mind through the intermediary of talking to other people. And when we're left alone with our thoughts, sometimes uh, we can feel a little bit uncomfortable, put it that way. So, uh, so any uh, other reactions? Yes, please. Uh, yes, the, the questioner is asking about uh, using counting. You know, um, in fact, um, uh, our, my teacher did say that counting is really good at the beginning. And uh, so even now, after meditating for more than 40 years, I always count at the very beginning. And the way counting is done is in breath, out breath, that's when you count at, on the exhalation. In breath, out breath, mentally count one. In breath, out breath, mentally count two, and so forth. And uh, I was having this discussion with one of the meditation instructors this week. They said, well, what do you do um, if you have a thought? 
And I remember hearing one of my teachers say, well, if you have a thought, that's no problem. Uh, you just go back to where you left off in counting. And then if you don't remember where you left off in counting, just go back to one. This is just, uh, this is not, see, this is not a perfection situation. This is a training situation. This is why they call it meditation practice, you see, is because many people think that when they hear or see an, a meditation instruction that they have to perfectly follow it. And the answer is we do the best we can. Uh, but uh, there is no, this is not a, a, what is it? This is not a perfection situation where we're trying to be perfect and have a perfect session of meditation. We're actually making friends with our body and we're making friends with our mind. And so uh, just like the uncomfortable conversations we talk about sometimes, sometimes we have an uncomfortable conversation with ourselves, like, oh, darn, I would like to be able to stay with the breath more. But that's okay. You can let go of that just as easily, right? And uh, so if, no matter which thought we're having, if it's the thought, oh, I wonder if, you know, I wonder if it's going to rain today, then just thinking, go back to the breath. Or what did that person mean when they said that to me yesterday, you know? And then we can label that thinking, let it go and return. Or oh, darn, I just got distracted. Oh, let that go and return, you know. Uh, so it's like that. It's, a, it's, it's a, a process of making friends. Anything else that people like to mention? Okay, well, then uh, let me give you a, a couple of pieces of advice and then we'll take a break, take a five-minute break because uh, we started a little late today because of the technical problems. And I want to make sure you get a chance to get up and stretch and uh, so forth. So um, when, uh, when we first start meditating, uh, it's best to start with a, a shorter period of time at first. Um, you could start with five minutes or 10 minutes to begin with, just to see what kind of meditator you are. Because... My teacher said that there are two kinds of meditators. There's the first kind of meditator is when they first sit down. So easy to put the body in the right position. So easy to follow the breath. So easy. But then the longer they sit, the harder it gets. He said that this person should pay attention to that and should sit for shorter periods of time at first. Maybe instead of having one a longer session, have two shorter ones. And then the second type of meditator is a person who, when they first sit down, th their attention is all over the place. It's really hard to settle down. But then eventually, after a few minutes, they their attention settles down. They settle down. And he said that person should sit for a little longer period of time a little longer period of time. And uh, so after you have done a few meditations at home, you'll have a sense of uh, which kind of meditator you are and uh, an ideal time for you to start. It's, uh, I think it's only since meditation began to be taught in the United States that people came up with the sort of 20 minute standard, you know, that you should try to sit for 20 minutes. But um, um, what my teacher told me was that consistency is more important than the length of your practice. He said it is better to do a short meditation every day and every day and every day and every day than to do a long meditation occasionally. So he said in this way, short meditations can help you um, uh, to establish a habit of doing it every day. And then you can gradually make them longer because what you find is what our other questioner was asking about, which is that what you'll find is that when you place your attention, you get a short period of attention followed by a period of mental wandering. 
and um, and I think that this that what happens is is that people think that there is supposed to be no mental wandering, but that's not possible. My teacher said a lot of people use the phrase "I need to empty my mind of thoughts so I have no thoughts." That's what they think the purpose of meditation is to empty their mind. But the fact of the matter is the purpose of meditation is to train our attention. Sometimes uh, lack of thoughts is a side effect of meditation, but it's not the goal. And so as a result, because the mind is active, you can't make the mind stop experiencing. It's just impossible. The mind makes thoughts. That's what it does. But we don't have to follow all of those thoughts. We don't have to follow them. We can actually make a choice. So we start with a period of attention that then goes into a period of wandering. Then we notice the wandering. We label it thinking and we return. And this is why you have to return gently. Don't return with judgment especially negative criticism or self-judgment. Don't return with that kind of thought. Return gently like you were redirecting a child. So you redirect and come back and think of it as a fresh start. And in this way, we practice compassion toward ourselves right there on the meditation seat, not demanding perfection, but being with our mind as it is. And when the mind wanders, you notice you label it thinking, you let it go, and you gently come back and then reestablish your attention. And what this does, uh, those of you who were with us last week to uh, watch uh, Dr. Julie uh, Brevsinski Lewis uh, give uh, her talks for COSI's Science Festival, the Center of Science and Industry had a science festival last week, and she came and gave three lectures here about brain science and meditation. I was her guinea pig. I was her lab rat back when I met her in 2007. That's how we met. She was, she was the researcher who was examining the brains of 10,000 hour meditators. And I was the subject. So that's how we met each other. Well, when she talked about brain science and meditation last week, she said that moment when you notice that you're distracted, is actually the power moment in meditation. It's where new neural pathways get made in the brain. She said in science, we call this the oops moment. When you notice that you are not doing what you were supposed to be doing. When you notice that and then gently come back, she said that strengthens a new habit. The new habit is kindness and the new habit is returning attention. And so she said, this is why it's so valuable to teach meditation in this way where you're not trying to clear the mind of thoughts. Don't do it that way. A lot of apps do it like that, but no, don't do it that way. Just stay with the breath. Know that you're going to wander. Notice the wandering. Gently let it go and gently return. Doing this over and over and over again strengthens your ability to notice. And it also allows you to be kind and gentle with yourself. So um, that's a very important thing to know. Now, as the questioner uh, earlier noted, there may be a time when you have a little, a little bit less thoughts in your mind or the period of uh, time between thoughts is a little less but this is not the main goal. The main goal is to return again and again and again, and to return with this incredible gentleness that allows us to be with ourselves without judgment. And in practicing being with ourselves without judgment, this helps us to be without judgment for others. So before we take our break, let's sit for another, just another two minute meditation. So we can work with our technique again, placing the body in the posture of meditation. Noticing the legs, the seat, the back, the shoulders, hands and arms, the chin, 
the gaze and the tip of the tongue. Beginning with the intention of being of benefit to ourselves and others. Taking one deep breath, breathing out, and then allowing the breath to come and go naturally. All right, that's another short meditation. So now um, at, uh, we'll, we'll take a, about a five minute break uh, and uh, you can use the restrooms. There are two restrooms, up, uh, three restrooms upstairs and two downstairs. Uh, there is also coffee and a snack if you would like to have that. So I'll see you in five minutes. Anybody who has questions, you can come up and we'll handle as many as we can. Thank you. <laughs> 